Choose life. Choose a job. Choose a career. Choose a family. Choose a fucking big television. Choose washing machines, cars, compact displays, and electrical tin openers. I first read the book, The Christmas After We Finished Shallow Grave, which was 1993. A friend gave it to me on the plane coming back to Glasgow for Christmas. And uh, I don't read that many books. And I suppose if you're a film producer, you think uh, everything you read could be a film. And I thought this would be wonderful if you could make a film that was this different as this is a piece of literature, different from most literature you read, that was this original, this exciting, this energetic. And I gave it to John and Danny. And I read it and it was like, it's just a new voice, you know, and whenever you come across one, you read loads of things and just every so often you come across a voice that's unique, new, disturbing, uh, irrational, uh, unpleasant, wonderful. It was all those things. I think it's a poetic masterpiece. I wanted to remain faithful to the tone of uh of the novel because I thought that's really the whole point in doing it. If you're not going to do that, then you might as well forget it. But in terms of detail, I thought, well, we've got to be sort of free to change the minor details in order to make it work. You have to say that uh, you've written a book and that um, somebody is making a book of the film or a, a, a film of the book or a, a play of the book or whatever. And the whole point of it, uh, the exciting part of it, is that it's going to be transformed in some way. And uh, the more uh, from my own point of view, the more kind of transformation, the better. We felt we had two choices. There was either to sort of go through the Robert Altman shortcuts way and have lots of overlapping stories, rather like the novel is, or we could do something and try and make a more traditional sort of linear narrative of some kind, which is what we tried to do, make it the story of the lead character, Renton. Renton's, uh, he's hooked on smack when we find him at the beginning of the story. And then he comes off it and on it and off it and on it twice. Maybe three times. And uh, he's kind of the uh, thinker. He thinks about everything and, and we hear a lot, most of his thoughts through voiceover. Usually quite quiet in the background of the scenes, usually a bit distant from the rest of the boys. He's slightly more uh, judgmental attitude about what they get up to than maybe they do themselves. Doesn't it make you proud to be Scottish? It's shy being Scottish! With the lowest of the low, the scum of the fucking earth, the most wretched, miserable, servile, pathetic trash that was ever shined to civilization. Some people hate the English, I don't. They're just wankers. We, on the other hand, are colonized by wankers. Can't even find a decent culture to be colonized by. We're ruled by a few assholes. It's a shite state of affairs to be in, Tommy, and all the fresh air in the world won't make any fucking difference. If it isn't funny, it won't work really, because it's got to be uplifting. There's something uplifting about it, and it's kind of ironic and curious that it should be uplifting, given the subject matter that they're dealing with. And that's why we tried... We haven't taken a, com a completely realistic approach to it, because, again, the, 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 the book is full of hints at surrealism, and that's one of the things that we try to push a bit further in this. outstanding cast, especially the five guys who are playing Renton, Begby, Sick Boy, um, Spud and Tommy. It's a useless motherfucker! That's what she called me! I said that, I said, look, I'm sorry! Did anything happen? Let's put it behind us! I see Tommy is just, as I say, potentially just going to be a normal straight guy. He's into going to the gym, he's into, he's into shagging mainly, that's his main thing, he's into shagging Lizzie, um, his girlfriend. And, um, I, th I suppose he, he's seen as the, like, the straightest out of the, the five of them. Spud is a uh, narcotics enthusiast. Um, a very gentle sort of variety. He's really uh, very calm. He sees everything in terms of like, the feline the feline world. He's sort of stuck in the 70s a bit. Got, like, but 
some 70s damage. Fuck off! That was cunt! I play sick boy. Which uh, he speaks for itself quite a lot, really. I mean, he is just uh, the beginning of the film. He's quite a, you know, he's into a good time and uh, his very sick attitude on life. Well, I play uh, Begby, Franco Begby, who's, uh, of course, was going to only be described as the main psycho of the piece. Without any kind of principle. Suppose any kind of models, he will stab, slash, bite, cut anybody who comes within five yards of him, really, who looks at him the wrong way. One of these kind of guys that you want to avoid in a dark night. Are you kidding me? I'm not a type of cunt that goes looking for fucking bother, like, but uh, at the end of the day, I'm a cunt with a pool cue and he could have a fat end in his puss any time he fucking wanted, like. So squares up, casual, like. What does a half cunt do? Or a so called half cunt? Shites it! Puts on his drink, turns, and gets the fuck out of it. And after that, one again was mine. You can't keep going around saying, just telling people through the media, through art, you mustn't do drugs because they'll ruin you. Because everybody's, ex there are a lot of people exploring them themselves to a certain relative degrees of safety you know and I think that's one of the joys about the book is that it tells you the truth about the other side it doesn't flinch to tell you what can happen to you but it also tells you just how extraordinary uh, these drugs can be well it's funny we had two weeks rehearsal and we learned a lot about drugs and we worked with the Carton Athletic boys in Glasgow ex, ex junkies who are we played football with them and, and one of them Eamon came in to show us how to cook up heroin and stuff with cookery classes with them and stuff and after the two weeks, it was like heroin was just wasn't a big deal anymore, you know. It gives us complete control to create our own sets. That's the thing. It gives us control over the over the space. We can film day for night, night for day. We can play around with the realism. We didn't want to make the film as the book isn't of Train Spotting isn't a completely realist read. This the film won't be either. It plays around with colours, perceptions, and various different things. If you look at the the pictures, the real pictures of, uh, of Muir House and the schemes during the 80s, and it's, they are so depressing to look at. Um, we didn't want to do that. We wanted to take a different option because the, the book is brighter than that to read. It's more enjoyable. It isn't, it isn't a depressing experience, and we didn't want the film to be uh, a realistic, depressing experience. When we started off, we tried to say, when is this set, you know? And if you look at the book quite carefully, it's really actually written from early, mid-80s through really to le the late 80s. And what we try to do in the film is make it stand for a period of time running from kind of the mid to late 80s up to now, really. And we've tried to illustrate that, not with signs going up saying 1987, but actually with pieces of music. <laughs> And with that, Mark Renton had fallen in love. What a penetrating goal that was! I haven't felt that good since Archie Gemmell scored against Holland in 1978.